Hello, everybody. My name is Justin, and I'm an addict. And thanks to my God, the steps, and the fellowship of other addicts, I am sober one day at a time since June 19th, 2015. And for that, I am beyond grateful. Welcome to the RICO 12 speaker meeting. We are an organization whose addictions include alcohol, drugs, lust, and sex, food, and gambling, just to name a few. We come together from all places, faiths, and backgrounds to learn the similarities of addiction and to gain tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. We invite recovering addicts with at least one year sobriety and who are actively working their recovery in their respective fellowships to share their experience, strength, and hope on a live Zoom meeting each Friday at noon central time for 20 to 25 minutes. Then we, the live audience, get the opportunity to ask questions of the speaker for another 20 to 25 minutes. If you find meaning in this episode or in any of the past or future episodes of the RICO 12 Speaker Meeting Podcast, we invite you to go and rate us and review us on iTunes or whatever podcast platform you are listening on. Also, please share this with others who you feel would benefit from these things. As we share, we are lifted ourselves. In order to ask questions, if you're here live, please type them in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you are hearing this podcast recorded and would like to participate as a live audience member in the future, or if you'd like to be a guest speaker in a future meeting, please go to rico12.com to learn more and submit your email address to there, there to receive weekly invitations or to submit to become a guest speaker. RICO 12 is self-supporting, and we appreciate your help in keeping that way. Uh, we gratefully accept contributions to help cover the costs of the Zoom platform podcast platforms, web hosting, and administrative costs. To contribute, you can go to www.rico12.com forward slash support, or you can click the link to PayPal there in the chat of the live meeting. Or if you use Venmo, you can also contribute there. Our handle is at rico-12, spelled out T-W-E-L-V-E. When you contribute, please specify the meeting number. This is meeting number 12. Now, uh, a quick announcement and a change to the way we've done things with um, contributions. In the past, we've had the speaker choose a recovery fellowship of their choice for a large portion of any contributions to go to. Uh, we've learned, and, and I knew this, but uh, I was hoping to kind of get around it, that uh, many, all fellowships basically, live according to the seventh tradition, which reads every AA group or whatever fellowship group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. So many have said, hey, you know what, thanks, but no thanks. Um, since you aren't a member, we aren't able to accept that uh, um, contribution. So um, we will be gratefully accepting contributions continually, but they will be to help um, cover the cost of the RICO 12 project and mission. All right, last week's meeting with Pamela from the UK was inspiring and full of energy. She spoke passionately on how the big book saved even an addictive eater. If you missed hearing that one, or any other meeting we have done, you can listen to them in podcast form by searching for RICO 12 Speaker Meeting Podcast on virtually any podcast platform that you use. Or you can go to the RICO 12 website and find it under the link podcast. Now, let's introduce our guest speaker for today, Kevin H., who will be speaking on emotional sobriety. Now, in his own words, Kevin says, I have been in Essanon for five years. I was a military pilot, and after the war, I got a I got out and started my own company. The past five years, I've been working in Essendon like it's a full-time job. I have 15 sponsees currently, and I was a chairman for the International Essendon Convention a couple of years ago. I am on the phone one to four hours per day working with men in Essendon or on meetings. And it's awesome to have Kevin with us, and I think he will give us a fresh perspective on a familiar subject. Take it away, Kevin. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Justin, uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about emotional sobriety. Um, <laughs> you know, emotional sobriety sounds so nice, but I'm going to really tell you what it really is. I'm going to go to Reflections of Hope. It's uh, one of Essanon's primary books. Uh, it's called the Reflections of Hope. And I'm going to go to page 99. So instead of talking about the emotional sobriety, I'm going to talk about a dangerous neighborhood. It says, my head is a dangerous neighborhood to go into, and I shouldn't stay there alone. I often use the phrase to describe to newcomers why I find, so, find it so important to reach out and make telephone support calls between meetings. 
even though I've been working the Essanon program for a number of years, I can still slip back into obsessive thinking. Sometimes the solution is as simple as calling another Essanon member and saying, hey, I'm having a difficult time right now. This situation over and hand it over to my higher power. The person on the receiving end of my call might only be listening. An ear of my may offer a suggestion such as, have you tried journaling about it? The benefits for me is that once I've shared a problem with another SNR member, I'm better able to turn it over to the higher power. Further reflections, many of us hesitated to call members on the telephone because we felt we were burdened by but reaching out benefits both the caller and the person who receives the, the call. I also heard not too long ago that the new newcomer is, call, is called the secret sauce. And I so believe that. Okay, so I always like to get in a little bit about, uh, you know, the problem, uh, you know, where I came from to get to the solution, how I, uh, how I was in the dangerous neighborhood. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest here. Um, you know, I was judged and juried by how I worked. If, uh, if I worked well, my parents loved me more. I was raised on a farm and uh, it was all about accomplishments and everything. You know, it took a lot of, you know, layers of the onion to really get down into the depth of, of where I had some problems. And the one area is the sin of comparison. For me, comparison is the cardinal sin of modern life. It traps us into a game that we can't win. Once we define ourselves in terms of others, we lose the freedom to shape our own lives. That's comparison, and that's the way I was raised up. X brother can do this. Why can't you do that? Um, and, and, you know, I started that way in my early part of my life, you know, and uh, uh, raising my four sons. Right now, I've been married 32 years to a, a beautiful bride. And I have four sons. And uh, so I'm just very grateful for the awareness of comparison because the real sickness of just that one little nugget right there of comparison. I remember one of my sons coming home from high school, a student, amazing person. And he goes, he brings home his report card and he got a B plus. And I looked at it and I said, hey, what's up with this B plus? And I could see, and I can remember just like it was the other day, I could, I could see him just melt away because of I didn't recognize him for all the good grades, but I was focusing in on the bad grade. And, and that is what I was raised, though. Um, you know, so uh, th that was a real uh, awareness there. So when I was really young... Uh, my dad was in the timber. We lived on a big farm. He was cutting trees. One day he was cutting a tree and he had a chainsaw accident and the chainsaw got into his leg and blood was everywhere. And I was six years old. My brother was eight years old. This was back before phones, uh, cell phones. And he, 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 he was about ready to pass out. I was freaking out in my brain. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't drive a tractor. My little, my older brother, who was eight, got on the tractor. I put my dad's head in my lap. Blood was everywhere. We drove over to neighbor's house, half mile away, and uh, they took him off to the hospital. I was there, frozen, uh, not knowing how to talk feelings, and uh, and when we came back, there was an, a, a time period. He, he made it okay. He he. His leg was okay, but it was just that incident right there that propelled me into a controlling, managing life for the rest of my life. I was not going to let, uh, you know, anything out of control. Um, wow. It's always still fresh in my brain. Um, so for a lot of us uh, folks in the Anon programs, that's what we do. We control, manage, fix things to the highest level. So you mix the comparison, you mix this controlling 
uh, huge trauma with me. And then so everything I did from that day forward, I had to kick it out of the park. I had to do the best at everything. Um, you know, sports, I had to do the best I could. Uh, in the military, you know, as a pilot, you know, that was, that was my goal to be the best. And unfortunately, that's what, that's what takes God out of our lives. Because at that point in time, that's when pride takes over, you know, and, and pride says it's because of us that we have these accomplishments versus letting our higher power in. That, that was my, my biggest, you know, challenge is pride. That's my biggest character defect. Uh, and, and vanity. Oh, my gosh. Vanity. The definition of vanity is inflation of pride of, one of, of one's achievements inflation of pride of ones and achievements. So, you know, those are a lot of the areas of the onion that I had to work on. Uh, uh, so after I, I went through flight school or was in flight school, I got married to a, a beautiful young lady and, uh, and things started changing a little bit. I started working more and more. Uh, it would be nothing for me to work from 6.30 in the morning to 1 or 2 o'clock at night. And uh, so I, you know, started the, my next addiction, which is workaholism. And I, and I worked that long for many years. It was 20 plus years I worked, you know, th those type of hours. Uh, I kind of grew apart from my wife. She was doing her own thing. I was doing my own thing. Um, and you know, through that time period, we, we had some rough times at that time, you know, she went on into her area of her, her area of addiction. And then I went over into my area of addiction, uh, you know, for, for Essanons, <laughs> the way we get into recovery is because of betrayal. What's well, majority of the Essanons. Other SNONs get in because of there is the definition of SNON how to get in is because it is did you have a problem with somebody who has sexaholism in your life, mom, uncle, family, friend, uh, or something. So that's the doorway into SNON. Uh, and betrayal is is one area that I work with, you know that I had to work through and then also work with a lot of guys. You know, that's that's the one that is so difficult to get to through the betrayal and forgiveness and get into recovery. Um, so, you know, in essence, I'm, we talk about the dangerous neighborhood and emotional sobriety and what that means for me is uh, a thought comes in my brain you start, you have a fixation of the thought, and then that thought starts ruminating as an intrusive thought in your brain. And then it goes into monopolizing the brain, and then your brain is hijacked. And then that takes, you know, the greatest share of my time in my brain. That's what I'm thinking about. And then you go into the next step is obsessive ruminating. And that dominates or preoccupies the thoughts, my feelings. It haunts me persistently, and it's totally abnormal. And then the last area of this area for me is delusions. It's impressions that are contradicting. Is it reality? Is it fact or fear? So that's kind of the steps for me and, you know, the dangerous neighborhood. Uh, so my, my goal is to always try and catch it is when it's a thought and, and you have this intrusive thought that comes into your brain. Okay, so you, 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 you'll, the, you have a fixation of a thought of anything. It could be work. It could be, you know, a fear. Uh, but once you have it, to try and process it right then. Okay, one of the things that I, I really work with my sponsees and I had to learn is fact or fear if you have a fear based thought that is not something to share with 
your friend or the person who your spouse that you're having actual fear about, you know, you don't take that fear to somebody because what that does, it gives that person shame. It gives that person guilt. And when that person has shame and guilt, they go into wherever they go into. It might be another, you know, uh, into their addiction. It might go into isolation. It might go into depression. So what we're taught in Essanon is to catch that fact or fear, if it's fear-based, and then to take that fear and then to take that and share that with somebody else. And you either can journal about it or call somebody. I like calling somebody or texting. So that, that's the whole area of to try to see if it's fact or fear. And then if you can peel back the onion just a little bit farther, then start trying to find the cause of those triggers. Okay, so why was I triggered in the first place? Since it was just a fear-based, it was a fact. So what do I do? And then you start looking at areas, and this is what takes a lot of time. And it takes a lot of energy to see this. I look at, did I, was I, did I feel unheard? Was it, did I feel judged? Did I feel not good enough? Did I feel not worthy? Did I feel left out? Did I feel blamed? Did I feel uncared for? Did I feel unloved? Did I feel controlled? You know, did I feel controlled? Did I feel betrayed? Did I feel unimportant? Or did I feel unrespected? So I, I, I look through all those areas to see where I might have been triggered. And then once I see that, then I can start really diving down. But I always like to, I had an old timer tell me, he goes, Kev, he goes, you have to pull off the scab to some of these old wounds in, your, in, in the past and reach down into that old wound and go through the pus of this wound and pull out the pus in, in this situation and bring it to life. You know, so that's where I have to go back. And, you know, sometimes it might be just rejection. And, and where did I feel that? And how did I feel it? So once I start learning who I am and what I'm doing, I start opening up this process of feeling my feelings. And I start unthawing. And I know when I start unthawing, I start understanding better who I am. You know, where do I feel guilt? Where do I feel love? Where do I feel all this? And some days I'll just start crying for no reason. Those are all great things because feeling is healing. And I love the opportunity of being able to feel something. I, I heard from a therapist a long time ago. She goes, therapy helped me go from surviving to living and thriving. So I had an old timer who said, you know, he really didn't believe in therapy, but I've done both. I've done therapy and I've done, I've worked the 12 steps. And I'm grateful that I was able to do both of them from thriving to surviving to living and thriving. Um, you know, I, I like the big book. One of the big book things that I so enjoyed in there is on page 417 in, 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 the, in the big book. And it talks about emotional sobriety. And it says, acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because uh, I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly as they are. It is supposed to be at that moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake. Until I could accept my ick, my stuff, I could not stay sober unless I accept my life completely on life's terms. I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on what needs to be changed, which that's where we get caught into this world, as on what needs to be changed in me and my attitude. So what I love about that that page in the big book is it really turns the focus on me. 
How can I change myself? And what can I really focus on? Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's pride it, it is such a deadly sin because it takes away my ability to think cognitively about myself. You know, when I go into a room of humility, of loving, of being tolerant, that's when things change in my world. And, you know, some, uh, you know, addictions talk about how, you know, it's life and death. And, well, I've actually seen that side of this addiction being life and death, which I didn't have great experience about that at the beginning because I, I, I didn't get to the uh, suicidal level, but I've had sponsees and people in program that had called me and talked to me. And so many months later, one of the sponsees came back to me, he says, Kev, he goes, I don't know if you know this, but he goes, I had my suicide letter written out when I called you and already had a plan of, you know, committing suicide. So that's how deadly this disease is of, you know, of codependency, of this craziness that's in our brain that takes over and tells us that we're just not worthy of living, you know. Um, so I have seen the the deadly side of this disease. I had, uh, there was, a, my home group is in Kansas City. And there was actually one person that came in, that young person, and young person, mid-20s, and was seeing a heart doctor every week just because that person was so wound up, so, you know, fixated on other people. Um, and, and that's, you know, the whole goal is to take the fixation off other people and bring it back to herself. I love the quote that says, this is where, you know, for anons, this is where it really gets interesting. If you're trying to control something, you're already out of control. And that's a slip in our program. If you're trying to control something, you're already out of control, and that's a slip. Um, you know, so for a lot of us, you know, of course, we don't set dates in for emotional sobriety because it would be just too difficult to do that. Did I judge somebody? Uh, was I trying to change somebody? You know, I, I always challenge somebody when they first get into s &on or any Anons or anybody, anybody, I challenge them. Do you give opinions to people without them asking for that opinion? If you do, in our world, that's a slip. So that's where a lot of people go, whoa, 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 whoa. You mean I can't give an opinion to somebody? I, I, been raised that way. Okay. In our world, we can't do that. Because once again, that's trying to control, manage, uh, manipulate, whatever, our side onto somebody else. So that's where we have to wait, pause and say, hey, would you like to hear my experience? Perfect example here. Got a great story here. My son was coming up the driveway in his car. And in his car, I hear this knocking. I know what that is. We all do. Guy, you've been around a while. You know, the uh, engine oil is low. And he's coming up. And I'm going over to him. I'm going out to him. I said, hey, would you like to have my opinion, my experience on what's going on with your car? He's a young and driving. He looked at me and we're a healthy family. We tried to use the traditions, the 12 traditions in our family, which we really try to operate by that. He looks at me and he says, uh, no, I don't want to hear your opinion, dad. My, I went like this. I'm going, you don't want to hear my opinion. He looks back at me. Nope, dad, don't want to hear it. 
So I turned back around, walked towards the house. I can remember this, biting my tongue because I wanted to say something so bad to him. Went in the house and uh, lo and behold, a week later, what happened? The engine blew, blew up. Uh, and he comes back, he calls me and he says, hey dad, I, I have a problem. He goes, my engine blew up. He goes, uh, uh, I'm, uh, you know, we'll probably have to get a new engine. I, I, I looked at him and said, oh, I am so sorry that that happened. I said, if there's anything I could do, please let me know. Period. Not so many years prior to that, oh my gosh, I would have given him a hard time, told him my you know, opinion, blah, 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 made him feel about that tall and went off. While in recovery for emotional sobriety, I didn't do that. I was being loving and tolerant. And that's what we're taught to do in all areas of our life. Not just our nucleus family, but our family outside our family, in our workplace, everywhere. Um, you know, one of the first things I, I really like to try to do is uh, when you get into a situation of frustration with somebody and, and you feel like it's kind of going out of control, think of one area of this. Is think of think, T-H-I-N-K. T-H-I-N-K. And that is, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? So the way I treated my son with his incident, it was kind. And it was inspiring. Ask him, hey, if you want me to help you, I'll be more than happy to help you. So if we can pause. So that's another thing. I, I like pause. Pause on, you know, I thought that was such a wonderful attribute that I had at one time was I could make quick decisions, rash decisions, jump in and do it. It's so the opposite. Now it's practicing pause. Pause before judging, before assuming, before accusing, uh, before reacting. Because if you can pause and take a break, it gives you a chance to Detached with love and detachment with love is one of our largest tools that we have in Essanon is being able to leave a situation, think about it and come back in and engage in that situation after maybe communicating with somebody and talking to somebody about it. Um, so for, you know, emotional sobriety, you know, it, it's all about staying at a calm rate. Here's a, somebody told me at a, a meeting a while back, they said, so Calvin, what's really emotional sobriety mean to you? And I said, I, I have an idea. I'll show you. Okay. You have two bottles. You have emotional sobriety. Okay. One bottle is a pop bottle full of pop and you shake it up like this and you open it up and that's what's not having emotional sobriety. It just goes everywhere. The second bottle is like my water bottle right here that I have at my work. So I shake it up, I shake it up, I shake it up, and I open it up. That's emotional sobriety to me. Not having anything in my mind, staying in a moment, staying in the present time, not trying to. <laughs> I used to think that if I was going into in the business world, going into battle, into a legal affair or, or, or some area. If I thought about something a hundred times this way and a hundred times this way and this way, I thought that was a positive thing. Holy cow. My therapist goes, cow, that's sick. She goes, you don't have to do that. Think about it a couple times this way, a couple times this way. And I go, but you mean me doing that? She goes, just stay in the moment. So for me, Staying in the moment is, is not future tripping, not thinking about the past, staying in the moment. My mind is like that, just a cool, calm, collective. Uh, it, I'm very grateful. You know, I told you those that thought process, you know, fixation, ruminating, monopolizing, obsessing, delusion. So for me, when that thought comes on my shoulder, and it just starts to ruminate a couple times. I can go like this boop, and knock it off my shoulder. 
you know, whereas before it would get on my shoulder and take over my body, take over my brain. And three or four weeks later, I'd go back and go, what was the whole reason why I started this whole process of yuckiness in my brain? And I had to go back two or three weeks ago. Oh, I had my fight with my son three weeks ago and it was ugly and I never talked about or journal about it and it's still in my body. So that's what we talk about when we, you know, have an examination of conscience of the end of the day. I think that's probably one of the, another great tool that we can have is at the end of the day, what did we did right, what we did wrong and what could I do better? And so, you know, so the examination of conscience for me, you know, keeps me in, in that time period. It doesn't let things kind of, you know, come up underneath my skin. So I'm going to, I'm going to end with uh, uh, a thought from an old timer. He says, uh, once a man was asked, what did you gain by regularly praying to God? The man replied, nothing, but let me tell you what I lost. I lost anger, ego, pride, greed, depression, insecurity, fear of death. So sometimes it's not the answer to our prayers. It's not gaining, but it's losing, which ultimately gives us our benefit and closer to God. So with that, I'll pass. Justin, thank you so much for letting me share about uh, the dangerous neighborhood. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. There was so much good stuff in there and, and several great questions have come in. I'm excited to get to those. Before we do that, though, um, if you wouldn't mind taking just a minute, 30 to 60 seconds, to talk a little bit about Essanon and how this organization helps you and maybe invite others who might um, need a similar organization to that to, to come check it out. Okay, so Essanon, uh, the way you're invited in is if you know somebody who has, uh, you know, you've been affected by sexaholism, could be anybody, could be a neighbor, could be a, an employee, or could be somebody in your workplace. But what that does is Essanon, it, is, it, it works through the 12 steps, and it's truly about recovering from that problem with the sexaholic in your in your world but ultimately all it is it's a doorway into recovering uh and and working the 12 steps for emotional sobriety for serenity uh and it's just a and then it also works 12 traditions and 12 promises and, and you can go to snon.org uh, they actually have a website. If you're wondering, well, do I fit or do I not fit? They have, I think, 23 questions you can answer to see if it fits, uh, if, you, if you fit into this program. And if you're a man and you had problems out there, we actually have a huge group out there around the world that is uh, men in Essanon. And feel free to give me a call or text me, and I can be more than happy to help you guys out in that area. Pass. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, once again, uh, I've put the link to snon.org there in the chat. And what we'll do for contacting Kevin is you can reach me via email and I can connect you through that email address for us is rico12, that's the number 12, pod, reco 12 pod at gmail.com. And I can forward any of those things to Kevin and you guys can then connect up and, and answer, have discussions about that. Um, we've had several questions come in, and it's time now for Kevin to answer your questions. Um, we'll get to as many as we can in the next uh, oh, 20 minutes or so. And uh, let's start here. Kevin, Matt says, can you sh please share some daily tools to remain emotionally sober? So there are so many pearls of the program with s and I love just that word, pearls of the program. Uh, they are, you know, um, from journaling to reaching out to, to one-liners. I love a lot of one-liners that I, I like to give out to people. Okay, so uh, easy does it, let go, let God, first thing first, this too shall pass. That's a big one right there for a lot of folks. This too shall pass because a lot of us are all or none. I mean, it's, we're in it and it's always going to be that way. It's not true. It's just for that moment one day at a time. And, and for me, the best one is pride, 
comes before the fall. Oof. That was a tough one. And another one that I really don't like, but it's so true. It's called terminal vagueness. Oh, I hate that one. Um, other tools of the program is, of course, we have wonderful literature in s and uh, in, in the men's group, we have actually a, a men's group me that has recovery going all the time on it. It's fantastic. Um, of course, my favorite is just reaching out. But I will tell you, for me, where I, I'm so grateful to be of service and, and to be service to other men in program. And uh, I mean, really, truly, service keeps me sober. So with that, I'll pass. Thanks, Kevin. I, I can't agree more with the uh, service keeps me sober. That's one of the reasons I feel I need to do this program here, this, this mission here. Awesome. All right, we have another question from Daniel. He says, Kevin, thank you for sharing your experience, strength, and hope. I really liked your statement, he feeling is healing. I tell people that I must have been absent on the day I was supposed to learn about feeling and emotion. What advice can you give to someone who is a newcomer at experiencing emotions and not running from them after having spent four decades in a paradigm that I didn't allow for feelings and emotions? How do I begin? It seems so overwhelming and so foreign. Thank you. You know, for me is, you know, one, first try to start understanding my feelings. You know, there's, for me, there was, I, I looked at it, but there's eight basic emotions with feelings after. And what we would do around our family, our nucleus family, my wife and I and our kid, we'd actually do these sacred talks. And a sacred talk is where we sit there and we actually go down each feeling or emotion. Let me see if I have one right here. I do. So here it is right here. Here's a card. We go down this card. You can see it right there. And we would say to each person, okay, what is anger? Your top plate anger. And then it, they go to the next person. We go to the next person. What is fear? What's the top plate fear? Pain, joy, passion, love, shame, and guilt. And each person would say their top plate one in their brain. And then after they said it, you just go on. There, there is no crosstalk. There is no uh, building of a case. You allow that person to be vulnerable at that time. And you don't bring it up again because the whole process of feeling and healing is trying to be vulnerable with a person, giving them an egg. I like this process of, I have an egg right here. Let's say this yo-yo here is my egg. I'm handing it to you, Justin. I'm handing this egg to you right now. You're taking the egg. I'm being really vulnerable by telling you something. And it depends on how you react to me if I'm going to be vulnerable with you again. If you go like this, I'm handing it over to you. And you go, boom. And the yolk goes everywhere over my face and it splatters me. I go, whoa. I'm not going to talk to Justin again about being vulnerable. That dude just smashed my egg all over me. That's how I look at being vulnerable. And I only want to be around people who I can be vulnerable with. That gives me hope. It gives me love. It gives me the needs that I need to have. So I hope that helped. I know it kind of went off to the side there a little bit, but that's how I, I gained that area of my life. Pass. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I will get a an image of that uh, emotions thing from you, and I'll post it on our website for anybody listening and not able to see that live. I think that's a really helpful thing. Um, you can find that at rico12.com. I'll uh, get that posted within the next day or two. And um, so by the time the podcast goes live, uh, you should be able to find it. All right. Next question comes from Monica B. She says, "Is that are there any tips for calming down while in a situation that can be very difficult or irritating? You know, like where our bottle is getting shaken up. How do we calm down in that, those situations? Okay. Well, I'm going to show you another flyer. Okay, so this is what I was talking about earlier about the your brain. Okay, Monica. So if number one, if we can start analyzing and know where we are in our brain. Okay, is it the thought? Is it the intrusive thought? Is it monopolizing? Is it fixation? And number one, know where we are. Start feeling that irritation. Oh my gosh, I'm irritated in my brain. And then start using some tools, tools, reaching out, disengage. The best thing to do, I have a Fitbit. If my blood pressure gets above 100 beats per minute, I'm out. 
I'm, I'm, I'm getting out and, and taking a break. I need to detach from that. So I take a break. I start pausing. I start working the tools. I look at my self-care. I talk to God, ask God to help give me grace onto an understanding of a situation. And I reach out to friends. So pause, feel the thought, feel the irritation, pause, take a break from it. Don't engage in it. You don't have to engage in it. And these are all also going along the line of boundaries. I really like to talk of boundaries sometime. Maybe we can talk about boundaries and how that helps because that's one of our biggest things we really have to work on is boundaries. But the biggest thing is just stop, pause, take a break and re-engage later. Don't do what I did one time, which was, okay, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm done with that subject. Okay. I didn't know how bad that was. That's called stonewalling. We don't stonewall. That, that's, that's another form of manipulation, which is another form of control, which is another form of a slip in my sobriety. I can't do that. I have to say, pause. I'll talk to you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Can we come back to that subject then? <sighs> okay. <laughs> That'll pass. <laughs> Oh man, that one hurt a little bit. Uh, I think stonewalling is is something that I've never put a name to, but uh, I'm pretty guilty of. Thank you for, for thank you for enlightening me on that. I appreciate it. All right, another question here for you. In your uh, in your initial talk, you talked a little bit about uh, shifting the fixation from others back onto self, and something that uh, came to my mind as you said that, you know, uh, and that I wrote down here. Does shifting the fixation from others to self? Can that lead to egoism and selfishness or, or what, what are some of the dangers that that could do and how do you keep from getting into those dangerous spots? Okay. So when I say fixing the, you know, thought out of my brain to myself is basically I want to do a fourth step inventory. Okay. Was I selfish? Did I have fear? <laughs> yeah. I have fear about everything. Okay, was it factor fear? Okay, so I'll go through that process. Was I dishonest or was I resentful? So truly, when I say, you know, coming back to myself, the best thing for me to do is the four-step inventory and really have a great understanding on who I am and why I do certain things. And then I can start labeling, it. oh, this is always around fear-based items. Ugh. Okay, how can I peel back the, you know, that area and finding out the cause of the trigger for that fear? And, and of course, you know, keeping God as the number one source of my energy, the number one source of my everything. You want to you know if a person's controlling, manager fixing? I'll give you some code words. Code words for this. I can do that. I have, th I have this under control. I can figure this out. I don't need help. Um, uh, you know, I have this completely by myself. Those are all code words for codependence. I'm just telling you a little secret because that's all the stuff I used to say. Now, I said one earlier today, this is the cutest thing. I was trying to get ready for this talk. And I said to myself, I, I got to figure this out. And right when I said that to myself, I go, holy shit, Kevin, you said one of those things you tell other guys not to do. So I stopped, I paused and said, God, can you help me get ready for this talk and help me reach some folks out there that could use some extra help? So I had, it's progress, not perfection. Pass. I love it. Some of my famous last words that I have to be aware of are ones that you related there. When I say, I got this, I know I'm in big trouble. I've got to step back and say, hmm, where, where am I? <laughs> Getting statistical here. What what is happening happening here that I need codependent, like you said? What's going on with this? Very good. One other one other uh, thing here, unless we have other questions come in from our audience. Um, there's a phrase that I hear often in recovery rooms that you alluded to, and you really delved into pretty well. But I'd like to get um, a thought or two from you based on on, on this phrase of being right sized. Um, what does being right-sized mean to you in, in, in regards to my ego, in regards to, you know, not getting too high or too low, right-sized? What does that mean to you? And how do you stay there? Okay. So codependency 
is a really slippery slope because, you know, for a lot of us, codependency is our strength, is an asset, you know, um, having managers around me that are codependent. I really like that. They're great workers. But here's the way I kind of think right size, what that means to me. If you're talking on a scale of one to 10, 10 here and and number one here and 10 here, 10 is ringing the bell. For a codependent, the best place to be is four to seven. Make it functional. So an example would be, you know, a team member saying, you know, that's a codependent over here working in bookkeeping, you know, and doing a great job there, but they want to go clear across the, the hallway and tell the sales manager on how to run his side of the department. Uh, dysfunctional, totally dysfunctional. So for us, you know, when we're giving an opinion, we're trying to fix people, we're trying to do all that without them asking it, guess what? That's in the dysfunctional side over here. That's where we try to learn to tell people functionally, it's great to help other people. But the key is a person has to say, hey, Kevin, you know, I broke my leg. Can you help me mow my yard? That's functional. I would love to be loving and tolerant and help that person versus me. I see the person broke their leg. I'm going to go down there and mow their yard with they, with it, whether they ask me or not. And that person already had it lined up with somebody else. That's where it's dysfunctional. Um, and, and, you know, trying to keep it right sized in my brain, what tool I use personally is I'm just another bozo on the bus. I am just another bozo on this damn bus, just trying to get along one day at a time. And that kind of keeps me where I need to be every minute of the day. Just one moment, one minute of the day, not knowing if I'll be here tomorrow or not. Not future tripping, not thinking of the past, just staying right here. That's what keeps me emotionally sober. Pass. Thank you, Kevin. Your your well, that was very helpful to me. And your phrase of being another bozo on the bus. Um, my sponsor told me that he, uh, when I was new in the program and still full of, you know, how how amazing and good, how much better I am than other people, whatever it would be, in my ups. Um, I, I told him once. I said, you know what? If these bozos in these rooms can do this, so can I. And he kind of laughed at me and he said, you know what? I'm the biggest bozo in the rooms driving the bozo bus right down the bozo street. And uh, man, it's such a powerful thing for me to recognize that. You know, and I will tell you in our rooms of Anons, we are, there's just a little bit of window for a person to get into recovery. I've been around a long time, especially men, unfortunately. Fortunately, now there's getting to be a nice group of men, but the past five, six years, I'd go to an international convention for s and men, and there'd be four to six people in there. That's all it is. And, and it's because I always like the Mission Impossible movie where Tom Cruise is coming down out of the thing. He comes down like this out of the roof, and he comes down, and he stops right here. And, and that, that's, that's usually a, an Anon's bottom. They stop about right here. And give them, you know, give me two, give me a week, two weeks, three weeks, and then boom, I'm way back up in the ceiling. And I have control of this. I can fix this. I have this under control. Don't worry about me. I don't care if the world is burning around me. I have this under control. That's the normal process of us and ons. Because that's who we are. We're, we're, that's where we live. So when we're down here at this moment right here, it's so important for to capture that person, to love them, give them tolerance to, and really get them involved. The sponsor, 90-90, and the odds are really good that that person starts seeing. And I always say this, I just hope and pray everybody in recovery sees the miracles of recovery. That's all I can, would hope and pray for everybody to experience the miracles of recovery as I have in any program. So <laughs> that'll pass.
Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate your time here. Before we close up, do you have any words of wisdom, closing words of wisdom that you'd like to share with us? Um, you know, the, the one thing that I can, I can share is huh, if you can breathe in God's will and exhale our own self-will. Breathe in God's will, exhale self-will. I think that's kind of the essence of, you know, our recovery and our growth to be able to see the miracles of recovery. So with that, thank you so much, Justin, for allowing me to talk. I so appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was a great RICO 12 weekly speaker meeting for all addicts and those uh, wanting to learn more about addiction and the recovery therefrom and anons. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, or if you have other questions, please go to rico12.com forward slash forum and join in our community and ask those questions and answer others' questions that will come up. I invite the audience to come back next week. If you have not yet gone to rico12.com and submitted your email address so you can get in on these weekly uh, uh, meetings and hear amazing speakers like Kevin and like others that we've had and others that we'll have in the future, please do so. Go to rico12.com, submit your email address, and get on that invitation list so you can join us live each Friday at noon central time. Next week, we will have Sarah, who is a codependent, who will be speaking to us. And I'm really excited about that, um, to have a um, somebody, a member of CODA. So if you'd like to join me now, uh, Kevin has chosen the third step prayer to launch us off into the rest of the day, the day. Please do so now. God, I offer myself to thee. Myself to thee to build with me, and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Keep coming back. It works when you work it. So work it. You are worth it. Remember that if you have felt something in this episode of the RICO 12 podcast and you'd like to share it with somebody else, please don't hesitate to do so. Have a great week. See you next Friday at noon central time. survive